Greetings ladies and gentlemen, this is the Inept General and with the new year having rolled through I thought what better time to look to the future of the Total War Warhammer franchise and in these wintry months let's have a look towards Total War Warhammer 3 and the probable introduction of Kislev. So get all warm wherever you are and let's go through the first in a multi-part series on Kislev Firstly, looking at the history of Kislev itself. Kislev's story really starts in the year of the Imperial Calendar, negative 76. So that's around 76 years before the emergence of Sigmar, in the lands that would become known as the Empire. And this is a time of primitive man. They just live in scattered tribes throughout the Warhammer world. No big kingdoms to speak of, really barely any permanent structures of any kind either. In around this year, there are two major tribes living in the lands that would one day become known as Kislev. And those are the Ropsmen and the Ungols. Now, relatively, they live in peace. There's the odd skirmish over cattle or what have you, but no major things or conflicts that could ever be described as a war between the two peoples. And they kind of just live in these lands in relatively nomadic lifestyles, using horses to get around and becoming very much a horse-based tribal culture. Not unlike Bretoni, far to the west, but in a very different cultural way. We move forward in time to the year one of the Imperial Calendar. Now we're using the Imperial Calendar, it must be noted because Kislev itself in its uh, interpretation of the Warhammer fantasy world has two different calendars they use, neither of which is the Imperial Calendar, but for the sake of simplicity, let's keep with the Imperial count. So in the year zero or one of the Imperial calendar emerges Sigma. This is around 2,500 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline begins. So Sigma emerges and he starts to unite the tribes of men against their common enemies. The Beastmen, the Greenskins, the tribe of the Norsi in the north who have turned to chaos. And he begins to unite the kingdoms of men to fight with him and to just drive back these forces to really establish humans as the dominant force within what would become known as the Empire. Now, Sigmar makes it as far north into the lands that would one day become known as Kislev and makes contact with the Ungol tribe who live up there and helps them fight off what would become the Norskans and drive them back into what one day would become described as Norska. So they drive them back out of the lands of the Ungols, forging an alliance. And when Sigmar goes on to forge the Empire and fight in his legendary battle of Blackfire Pass, the Ungols join him and back him up. But because the Ungols live a very nomadic lifestyle, they, unlike the other tribes of men who help Sigmar, aren't really granted a province as such. They're just sort of left to their own devices in the north to use their lands as they see fit. No real clear border short of the uh, borders of Oslo and the neighboring empire provinces, who at the time had actually owned a lot more northern territory. Um, they ate into the Ungols land a bit more. The Ungols tended to live in what would become mainly the northern part of the lands that would one day be Kislev. So it goes on like this for millennia. The Ungols are left to their own, they are allies. If the Ungols need help, the Empire will come to their aid. At least there's this historic alliance that stands there. Which moves our story way forward from the year 1 to the year 1479. Still around the thousand years before the start of the current Total War Warhammer timeline. And now we join a people far to the east known as the Gospodars. Over the World's Edge Mountains, they live in the Eastern Steppes. Now, the Gospodars have long been fighting the other tribes of men. The Norsi weren't the only ones to turn to chaos. Many tribes of men have turned to chaos, and they are fighting the Gospodars, who, for many centuries now, probably, have been fighting off the chaos threat and never succumbed themselves. But times are getting bad. It's a war of attrition. They're starting to lose against these madmen who come from further north territories than themselves. And so inevitably, over time, the Gospodars start to lose territory to their previous neighboring tribes, the Kurgan and the Hung, who had both turned to chaos. And in their desperation, they started praying to their gods, firstly their main god, Urson, the bear god, who had taught their people how to survive in these freezing winters, how to hunt, how to war properly, but Urson couldn't teach them how to face this chaos threat. And so they looked in other spiritual places. And some people within the tribe of the Gospodars had the ability to commune with spirits. 
and upon doing this, one of their ancient people reached out to a spirit who is known either as the Ancient Widow, perhaps more simply the Land, or even popularly known as Kislev. And this ancient spirit cried out to her and said, I will give you a great gift with which to fight the armies of Chaos if you do me a solemn promise to come find me and liberate me from the forces of chaos and look after my lands where I am. And so Mishka, the first woman to reach out to the great spirit of Kislev, the ancient widow, was granted the gift of ice magic. And with this gift, she was able to fight off the hordes of chaos, but as the myth goes, she still had to look for the lands of this ancient spirit. And so, while being forced away from Chaos, but still able to use ice magic against them, they decided to shift westward and went over what would become known as the High Pass in the World's Edge Mountains, coming into the lands of the Ungols and the lands that would one day go on to be known as Kislev. Now, Mishka at this point had gone on to become known as the Khan Queen, the leader of all of the Gospodars with her innate gifts for magical powers. Now, over the last 20 years since she first attained the gift and had marched into the lands of the Ungols, the gift will eventually spread throughout the people of the Gospodars, probably along genetic lines it's fought, but no one really knows. But the idea being that the gift of ice magic is unique amongst humans at this time. Magic in the Empire is unusable almost. It's not... Some people do have the gift for magic, they're born with it in the Empire, but... That whoever uses it, it's almost inevitable. Like, without exception, they turn to chaos. Humans who try to use magic at this time within the Empire turn to chaos. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of just when. And so magic is kind of banned and no one really messes around with it because you know you go insane and turn to chaos if you even delve into it. So these guys, the Gospodars, coming over these hills with magic in their armies is something that the Ungols can't compete with and so the Ungols start getting pushed away. The southern lands, the most northern territory of Ostland and Ostermark, are pushed away as well. They're starting to be driven back. Now, as I mentioned previously in the stories, the Ungols and the Empire have an alliance. So you may ask, why did the Empire not ride north? Surely just out of sheer numbers, the Empire could help the Ungols fight off the Gospodar. But the issue here is that the Empire itself has been in turmoil for centuries at this stage. There's three or two emperors at any one stage, there's fighting amongst them, there's religious warfare against the different cults within the Empire. The Empire is in no collective manner able to hold off the march of the Gospodar. Sometimes the Ostlanders try and help out, but they're driven back as well. This magical gift and the sheer warring nature of the Gospodars, the fact they've basically been in permanent war of chaos, has really hardened them as an army, and they start a constant march across the land of the Ungols. Now, during this stage, a lot of stuff is happening. Mishka goes on to be known amongst the Ungols and the Ropsmen as Mishka the Slaughterer. This is where she earns her name as the Khan Queen of the Gospodar, because she's just marching through these territories the Ungols like a hot knife through butter. So during this march it takes them about three years to get to Prague. They take the city of Prague and then by 1499 they put so much pressure on the Ungols they decide okay if you're going to take our territory we're going to march west and take the territory off the Ropsmen and they completely annihilate the Ropsmen at their major city of at the time was called Novigrad but as you and I might know it in the Total War Warhammer Center and just Warhammer fantasy sense as Erengrad, as it would later become known. But they march to Novigrad, take it over, and that's where the Ungols decide to have their last stand. Meanwhile, the Gospodars march south, take over some of the land from Osland, and sort of completely embark on carving out the borders of what would one day become known as Kislev. During this time, there's also a tribe of Ungols known as the Kossars, who uh, fight with bows and axes. They have this very weird way of fighting, but the Gospodars like it, and so they sign them up as mercenaries. And so this one tribe of Ungols actually joins the Gospodar army to fight alongside them to drive out the rest of the Ungols. About 25 years into this conquest of the Ungol territory by the Gospodar, the Gospodars in 1524 of the Imperial Calendar 
found the city of Kislev. Of course, the city takes its name after the great spirit, the ancient widow, the spirit of the land, Kislev herself, who granted the Gospodars the gift of ice magic to begin with. Now, around this time, when the Khan Queen Mishka is consolidating her power in Kislev, establishing her firm borders, raising a larger army, is when a certain mad dwarf known as Alaric the Mad comes to visit her in Kislev. Now, together, they work on forging the magical blade Theofrost, inserted with ice magic and the savvy of Alaric the Mad, who was, of course, a dwarf famous for forging the rune fangs, the swords that Sigmar gifted to each of the provincial lords when he founded the empire. So the same dwarf that made the rune fang went to Kislev and helped them forge a magical sword of their own known as Theofrost. Now, at the time, there was kind of a premonition about if a man ever learned ice magic it would corrupt the entire stream of ice magic and render it to chaos or just mean very bad things for ice magic users perhaps ending the practice entirely and as such men are never allowed to learn ice magic and so the sort of cadre of people magic users within Kislev would become known as the ice witches and they're the only ones who can actually wield the sword fear frost if a man was to ever touch it it would freeze him instantaneously and he'd almost shatter on the spot only uh, probably the leader of the ice witches at any given time is allowed to wield fear frost and no man can ever touch it i'm not sure about women in general who don't know magic i imagine it'd be probably be deadly for them as well but that's what's going on just a huge consolidation of power and only two years later gospodar army marched to novigrad and finally and decisively deal the last defeat to the ungol people basically making it that the Gospodars have won. They don't wipe out the Ungol people. There's still a heavy population. There's just no military offense. And it's kind of a cease of fire. The Gospodars run stuff. The Ungols can live in the territories that they want. They're nomadic people anyway. They're kind of free to wander about where they want to. But the Gospodars now rule these territories. And thus... The kingdom of Kislev is born, the kingdom of two peoples, uh, with the Ropesmen, who I think pretty much the Ungols wiped out completely. There's no mention of the Ropesmen uh, ever again. They kind of disappear out of history after their defeat at the Ungols. So it's just the Ungols and the Gospodar, and really together become known as Kislev. Over the next 800 years, Kislev really established itself. The leader of Kislev gave himself a new title of the Tsar and Tsarina. This is always a Gospodar uh, descendant. The Tsarinas are usually gifted with the gift of ice magic due to their bloodlines, but this is kind of how it goes on, and the Empire during this whole time is still in turmoil, there's infighting, but Kislev itself establishes firm friendships with different provinces, and, you know, can reach out to them if need be, if anything else happens in terms of major chaos excursion. Now, by the year 2303, over the last couple of years, the incursions of the chaos Norsken tribes have been growing more and more intense, and it eventually is revealed in that year that Asavar Kull has risen to the ranks of the ever-chosen and a full-on chaos invasion, the likes of which have never been seen by anyone living in the human realms at this time, begins to march southwards into Kislev. Now, Kislev itself has a number of scouts in the mountains, so they had word early on that this was going on, and so sent riders all across the empire to ask for help. The only people who ever got there anywhere near in time to help the Tsar at the time, who was Tsar Alexis Vasilievich, was the armies of the province of Osland, a long-time friend to Kislev at this stage. And together, they mounted what opposition they could. The armies of Osland and Kislev rode out to meet this chaos threat head-on. When they came across the chaos herd, they were in shock. A horde the size they'd never seen before. But the brave men of the Empire and Kislev stood their ground and met this chaos threat with a clash of shields on the front line and for a time it seemed like they would hold. The men of Osland with their shields and blades holding back the oncoming tide with the Kislevite lancers slamming into the flank of the chaos forces with a charge so devastating that it almost caused the whole horde to falter and for a time the Kislevites and the Ostlanders allowed hope into their hearts. It was not to be, however, as the ground under them began to shake, 
thunder erupted out of the skies above them as lightning began to streak down, and from the rear of the horde emerged the monstrosity that was Kolek Sun Eater, leading a charge of Shagoth and Dragon Ogres straight at Kislev and Ostland. The Dragon Ogres were devastating, ripping horse and rider in half with single blows. They caused devastating damage to the Kislevite cavalry as well as the Ostland infantry. The sheer sight of these monsters drove fear into the very hearts of the brave human soldiers and they had almost no choice but to break. The army turned and ran, hoping to regroup south of the rivers of Kislev to use the rivers themselves as a choke point to hopefully mill down this horde, to grind them down and to negate their superiority of numbers. And this is where the vile and corrupt chaos sorcerers used the land and climate of Kislev against those who called it home. They used their foul magics to summon forth all kind of blood and viscera to fill the rivers of Kislev, slowing their flow and allowing the cold to freeze them solid. This allowed the Horde to use its armies to completely encircle the armies of Ostland and Kislev, putting them to the sword, slaughtering them mercilessly and leaving few survivors, if any, who made their way broken and beaten back to the great city of Prague. Now, all they had to do was hiding behind the great walls of the city. Now, I apologize in advance for this, a little side note. I'm never sure how to say this in Warhammer. Um, I know in the real world, in our world, it's pronounced Prague, but I'm not sure if you're meant to say it Prague in Warhammer or just say it like Prague as we have in the real world. So I might interchange between the two. I might stick with Prague. I don't know, guys. Whatever, you get what I'm referencing when I say the word. So, the Siege of Prague continues, and the whole horde of chaos ends up surrounding this city. Now, the city has little hope, but they do get messages in and out from time to time, and the only hope they really have, as Kislev and as the city itself, is that there is word of a spark of hope within the Empire that has been ignited. But these are very vague mentions, or perhaps there's a guy doing some stuff down there, and he'll ride to help them. But, you know, there's hope building. If they can just hold out long enough, they might make it through this horror. However, completely surrounded, the people quickly begin to starve. The sheer amount of refugees from the surrounding northern part of Kislev who made it to the city before the horde swept aside their villages had really put a strain on the food capacity of the city, and so starvation begins to set in very quickly. And that is promptly followed by plague that has come from the winds of the horde into the city and begins to strike a number of people down killing them with the most horrible pus-filled wounds on their body. It's just an absolute disgusting horror show within the walls of the city. However, in a weird way, it might have helped save it for a little bit longer because it allowed the food stores to be stretched all that further with these diseased and dying individuals. Now, outside the city, unbeknown to the troops of Kislev within it, the Asavar Kull, the Ever Chosen, um, doesn't intend to march on the city until the plague has completely devastated its numbers. You know, he's got a lot of work to do. The Horde, this is just like step one of a 27-part plan. So, step one, take over Kislev. So, he's kind of trying to save the army strength before he marches in. However, unbeknownst to him, this has allowed the time for a new hero within the Empire to rise. The whispers that they heard within the city were true. So, as Plague is just destroying the citizens... Out in the Empire, something miraculous has been happening. A man coming out of Nullan by the name of Magnus the Pious has managed to unite the Empire and is gathering troops to march north from every conceivable source within the Empire to march against this Chaos Horde. Magnus, with the largest Imperial army ever gathered, gets to the borders of Kislev. He's here joined by other Kislevite troops, lancers, winged lancers joining his army at this point, and he decides that his army is so vast he needs to split it up because he thinks that he can't actually supply this huge army at once. 
So he decides to send the quick part of his army, a lot of the cavalry and such, north to relieve the siege at Prague, and the rest will go to Kislev to gather supplies and then march north to rejoin the fight. So the contingent sent to Prague race off to try and lift the siege to help the city before it's too late. Meanwhile, at the city itself, the plague has kind of washed over the city at this stage. The people have been annihilated. The population is a fraction of what it was at the beginning of the siege. And it is now that Asabar Kul gives the signal and the chaos hordes march forward. However, the fight is not out of the brave men of Kislev. And they put up a fierce defense at the walls of Prague. They kill ten men for every one of them, if not a hundred. These are the fierce warriors of the north, and they will not succumb to the forces of chaos whom their ancestors have been fighting for centuries. They lead a valiant defense to the point that Asavar, the ever-chosen, gets extremely frustrated, and it has, this has wasted all his potential saved arms for waiting so long to take the city, and he just signals for Kolek, the Sun Eater, the Mountain God, to come forth and do his duty. With one mighty swing of his hammer, Kolek Sun Eater smashes a hole in the mighty walls of Prague, and the horde of chaos pour in. They slaughter every man, woman, and child within the city that they can get their hands on. The chaos sorcerers begin some kind of vile, corrupted incantation that brings the walls of the city to life as tendrils fling out and grab the freeing citizens, only to entrap their bodies and souls within the walls of Prague itself, which becomes almost this living horror as it begins to grab at whatever it can, embedding their faces into the walls of homes, houses, and the outer wall itself. Help was on its way, but it was far too late for the city of Prague, and the Chaos Horde moved south, with Kislev its next target in mind. The fast-moving troops of Magnus the Pious had arrived a few days too late. They got there, and the Kislevite lancers saw the horrors that their countrymen had been put through. Bodies hanging from battlements, the screaming faces of children embedded to the walls of the city itself. This was beyond warfare and will be avenged by the warriors of Kislev. This outriding group of fast-moving cavalry then decided to turn and chase the horde as it moved south. Magnus the Pious himself, meanwhile, had arrived at the walls of Kislev only to see that the horde of chaos had just arrived and was beginning to set up a siege encampment around the city of Kislev itself. Within Kislev, the Tsar was there, and he'd been reinforced with a group of dwarves, including the presence of the High King himself at the time, who had come to help and honour the old alliance between men and dwarves. However, they were trapped within the city, and did not have the manpower to force their way out of a siege. Seeing no other option and running low on supplies, Magnus the Pious had no other option but to order the charge, as the artillery began to bombard the chaos hordes, tearing bodies to shred, but no matter how many they seemed to fell, there were always more to replace those troops they had just taken down. Chaos sorcerers began their work of raining down bombardments on these army of men, only to their surprise to find their spells being unbound. For the first time, men, apart from the ice witches of Kislev, had managed to master the winds of magic. One of the high elf's guardians, known as Teclis, had come over from Ulfwan, having just faced a great threat beside his brother himself, came over to teach the armies of men how to use magic relatively safely without being corrupted by the forces of chaos. Kislev was not now the only army with magic on its side, and these human mages, backed up by three arc mages of the elven people, began to rain down their own magics on this chaos horde. 
Despite causing devastating damage to the Horde, they were still outnumbered and the Chaos Army moved to flank and surround the army of Magnus the Pious. They just couldn't make up for the numbers. Seeing that this new help had come for them, the Dwarves within Kislev marched out to try and make it to their saviours and fight by their side, only to be rebuffed back to the gates of Kislev, losing half of their number in the process. All seemed to be lost. Even this vast imperial army was about to be surrounded. What hope did the people of Kislev have? What hope did humanity have? Then, over the crest of the hill that would one day become known as the Hill of Heroes within Kislev, the sounds of the horns resounded around the valley below. The outlying force of the cavalry of the Imperial Army had arrived on the battlefield, and sounding as though they were rolling thunder itself, they charged down the hill by their hundreds, by their thousands, perhaps even by their hundreds of thousands, and smashed into the rear of the Chaos Horde. Lifted by this last chance, this time the Dwarf and the Tsar and the whole army of Kislev the city marched out. The Horde was now taking charges on three sides and they were being devastated. They could not regroup in time enough to meet one threat or the other. The ranks started to break. The tribesmen, those of weak faith within the Chaos Hordes were the first to begin to run. They were promptly ridden down by the cavalry skirting around the edges of the Chaos forces. This army of Chaos, this vast horde of the Ever Chosen, was broken by the force of elves, dwarves and men outside the gates of Kislev itself. It was many days work riding down and killing the last of this Chaos Horde, but the men of Kislev and the Empire were up to the task. There were other branches of this invading force that had invaded other parts of Kislev, and over the following weeks, the united forces of Magnus the Pious and the forces of Kislev and the Ice Witches fought this force back. And so Kislev and humanity were saved from the ever chosen and his oncoming horde this day. And that was the end of the great conflict that would become known as the Great War Against Chaos. This is a time where Magnus went back to the Empire, uh, brought everyone under his banner yet again, and became uh, the unifying force, bringing the Empire together to the force it once was before the centuries of inner conflict. It strengthened the alliance between Kislev and the Empire, as well as really the alliances between humanity and the dwarves and uh, the Empire and the High Elves, with Teclis teaching them how to manage magic properly, and going back and setting up the Colleges of Magic in Altdorf itself. So after this time of great conflict, uh, which, you know, I may have missed a few details here, some sources conflict with each other. For example, this picture here I think is a great picture of the forces of the Empire and Kislev coming together, and in some places I've seen this picture cited as the Tsarina Alexis, rather than the Tsar Alexis at the time, but different sources put him as a man, and I've never really seen him noted as a woman anywhere except for in this picture, but I just thought it was very uh, symbolic of the, uh, you know, the relationship between Kislev and Magnus the Pious at this time, and the Empire as things went forward, and some sources conflict in terms of the details of the Great War Against Chaos, as they probably would in the Warhammer universe, but hopefully I gave you guys the broad strokes. Um, there were some details I missed out, like the different branches and the different generals during the Great Chaos War coming down into Kislev, but I might do a more detailed video on the whole Great War uh, in its own right at some point later on down the line, but just giving you the broad strokes of what happened happened as far as the historical context to Kislev is concerned. So the Great War concludes in the winter of 2302 or sort of towards the beginning of 2303 and we skip ahead now in terms of the Kislev timeline to the year 2498 of the Imperial Calendar and that is when Tsar Vladimir Boka dies fighting a huge gobbo gathering east of the city of Kislev, and his son Boris Boka takes over as Tsar. 
Now, Boris becomes one of the most legendary czars in the history of Kislev itself. In the year 2499, so the first year of his reign basically, he rides out to meet a huge incursion of beastmen who have made their ways into the borders near the city of Prague. Now, there's a lot going on in this city, which has re remained really eternally cursed since the Great War Against Chaos, but we'll get into that in one of our later videos when we cover sort of the lay of the land in Kislev in this series. That will probably be the third video in this series, so look out for that one. But we'll cover the curse of Prague a little bit later, but he's marching out of that city, and uh, he marches out to meet this horde of beastmen. Now, this battle is vicious, but he shows tactical cunning and manages to slaughter this war herd and turns the snow field on which the battle is fought completely red with the blood of the beastmen, earning himself the name Raddy Boka, or Boka the Red, or Tsar Boka the Red, or simply the Red Tsar, for the blood of the beastmen he spilt that day. Now, after he took power, it wasn't all battling for this Tsar Boris. He actually set about trying to rebuild the Kingdom of Kislev, which hadn't really recovered since the days of the Great War. People had been selfish, its nobility and rulers had kind of hoarded the money to themselves and not really spent it on rebuilding the kingdom. Boris was going to see this change and almost emptied the entire treasury of Kislev on building, on rebuilding even, infrastructure, roads, repairing walls of fortified townships, really just getting the infrastructure in place for Kislev to be a profitable and flourishing kingdom once more. And he imported black powder from the empire as a weapon to really improve the armies. He also spent a whole bunch of cash on employing mercenaries to update the training of the Kislev troops with things like gunpowder weapons and artillery to really make them an effective modern fighting force. Now using all this money to do all these projects almost bankrupted the treasury, his own family and the family of the many nobles who he insisted helped pay for all these improvements as well but it paid off and trade began to improve around Kislev, more people began to move there, it became a flourishing kingdom as he had intended under his leadership. So not only a great warrior leader, but a great administrative leader as well for the kingdom of Kislev. Between the years 2499 and the years 2503, uh, the Tsar had a daughter who was named Katrina. Now, she was a lovely and beautiful girl and his only child, I believe. Now, around the year 2503, uh, he also sought to start to revive the cult of Urson. Now, we discussed Urson a little bit earlier in the video. He was the god of the Gospodars, the bear god who they prayed to, who they credited for being able to survive the harsh northern climates and teaching them how to live and flourish in such weather. The god of the bear, and this had really started to fade. With the closer ties to the empire, the god Ulrich from the empire had started to come over, and the god Tal from uh, Talabekland had started to become a major influence in Kislev as well. Now, Boris wanted to really revive Urson, as I said, and so began to be worshipped the god himself, uh, sort of give some money to the cult of Urson to try and improve its strength and position in Kislev society, and he himself decided to undertake uh, becoming a priest of Urson. So he had to go through the initiation, which was to go out into the wilderness by yourself and tame a bear. So he disappeared into the forest of Kislev, and it had been some, you know, 18 days and no one had heard from the Tsar. At this point, people were a little bit worried. He insisted on going alone, no bodyguard or anything. It's like, our king went into the woods to look for a bear. You know what? Odds are he might just be dead. Let's send out some search parties. And people had begun to prepare the very young Katerina at that time to take over from her father and be uh, coronated as Zarina. But however, the next day, the search party found Boris. He was crumpled and unconscious beneath the body of the biggest bear any of them had ever seen. Covered in massive, thick white fur, the bear was ferocious and huge, and the two of them were surrounded by the corpses of wolves. Now it was thought that either the Tsar was dead, but they could see him breathing, but they couldn't get anywhere near him thanks to this bear. It took another day for the Tsar to awake, 
and eventually sort of managed to communicate or talk the bear down so he could approach his men and tell them the tale of what had happened. Fifteen days into his trek through the woods, he encountered this enormous bear, the largest bear he'd ever seen or even really heard about, and he saw this as a sign from the god Urson himself that this was to be his bear, the bear he had to tame, and so he approached the bear and entered into conflict. Unarmed with just his fists, he battled with this mighty beast as the two exchanged blow for blow, dodging and parrying, using his bare fist to rain down strikes on the bear's muzzle and face, while the bear clawed at him with talons the size of daggers and tore through his flesh. Both the bear and the man were bloodied. The two of them battled for over a day, and as the darkness descended upon them and the scent of their blood caught the wind, where a pack of ravenous wolves emerged from the darkness surrounding the two combatants. Initially, the wolf pack went directly for the bear, and, Bor and Tsar Boris got in their way. Grabbing the first wolf out of the air, he crushed its skull with his bare hands before tossing away its lifeless corpse. Then he was striking at any wolf that dared approach as the wolves clawed and bit at him. Eventually, already wounded from the strikes of the bear, the man collapsed, and just then, the bear itself swiped the wolves off of Boris's body, killing three of them with a single swipe in the process, and began to battle the rest of the wolf pack. Eventually, the surviving wolves tucked tail and fled into the darkness yet again. The bear turning towards the unconscious body of Boris, took a protective stance over him, and for the remaining four days, guarded him, even from his own men. Now this was the tale of how Boris managed to befriend, if not quite tame, the mighty bear that would go on to become known as Erskine, his companion and mount for the rest of his days as he led the armies of Kislev on the battlefields against the ever-present threat of chaos. Now, over the years, Boris went on to acquire a couple of legendary items as well, the first of which was the Shard Blade. Now, not being able to wield the legendary blade Theofrost, which the first Tsarina had managed to make for herself with the Mad Dwarf, if you remember earlier in the story, he got a weapon of his own made, known as the Shard Blade. It was crafted from ice hewn from a glacier in Norska, and then with ice magic, it was made to be permanent in its state and never melt. Now, when it strikes an opponent's body, the cutting ice will embed shards of itself they will enter an opponent's bloodstream and start to cause them internal damage. That is the gift of his weapon, the polearm, Shard Blade. He also got a wonderful piece of armor made for himself known as the Armor of Orson, forged on the spring equinox, which is a holy day in the religion of Ursin. Um, it was made by having the molten steel mixed in with the powder of bear bones, giving it the strength of the mightiest bear, the armor itself. Now, over the years, he became a wonderful warrior, again, fantastic administrator, really bringing Kislev to the peak of its power it ever really had at any point point in its history. His daughter was found to have the blessing of ice magic within her blood as well, and went on to become the preeminent ice witch within Kislev, really power believed to be unsurpassed since Mishka, the first of the ice mages. Indeed, many say she is Mishka, the Khan queen, Mishka, the first Zarina, Mishka, the slaughterer, reborn. And the two of them are the heads of the royal family of Kislev, as we enter into the Total War Warhammer timeline. Now, many of you will say that Boris dies, but if we take the beginning of the Total War Warhammer timeline as the coronation of Karl Franz, that happens around the year 2500 of the Imperial Calendar, and Boris unfortunately meets his end around 2517 of the Imperial Calendar. So if we do ever get a Kislev army, perfectly acceptable for Boris to be in it at the beginning at the very least. 
So Boris and Zarik, Zarina, Kat, well, uh, and Katarina, who I suppose would not be a Zarina until Boris himself dies. Boris the Red Tsar um, would be great legendary lords for the armies of Kislev and our, as I said, its current rulers. And that really brings us up to the current timeline. So that's the way things stand in the Warhammer world in as far as Total War is concerned. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed this first of maybe a three or four part series uh, looking at Kislev. The next video will be coming out uh, in a few days looking Looking at the army of Kislev and what that might look like in Total War Warhammer 3. Um, as I said guys, looking forward to seeing the Kislev army then. Hope you enjoyed this historical look at Kislev and what sort of makes up the people. I thought it's good to have this context because a lot of the armies of Kislev and um, the history of Kislev and the units you get have a lot to do with this division between the original Gospodar people and the Ungols uh, who are the sort of original natives of Kislev itself. So it's worth bearing that in mind going forward. I do reference a few things in this video that I've made videos about before, such as the province of Osland, or Teclis himself with his brother and what he'd just been through before he came across to the Empire. If you'd like to check out any of those videos, uh, please do click on the uh, links uh, you can see here, or you'll find links in the description below. But as always, guys, a huge thank you for watching, and hope to catch you all on the next one. Alright guys, thanks. Bye.